Well, I'm going to tell you a rather fantastic story today that will conjure up for you a part of my childhood and which will also be a wonderful example of the, of the complexity of what might be called family or folk narrative. First of all, my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, who was a saintly beloved figure by all of her nieces and nephews and grandchildren, of which she had, she had 37 grandchildren and 50-some great-grandchildren at the time that she died. And, um, and all of her sons-in-laws and anybody who knew her had a kind of worshipful regard for her. May Lowry. My mother carried her middle name. My mother's name was Dorothy May Lowry, her maiden name. My grandmother lived in a very humble house built by my grandfather and his brother's own hands, probably around 1910, before the First World War. My grandmother was born in 1889, same year as Hitler. Strange thought. She was very unlike him. And at some time, she moved from Blanner Hazard Island, a very famous island in the Ohio River, which is, has a small and interesting community of people on it. It was known historically for the fact that Aaron Burr had gathered arms there with John Blanner Hazard, for whom the island is named, in order to overthrow the, the United States government in 1803. But he failed to do so. The plot was failed. He was tried and whatnot. But in any event, it was a vice president trying to throw over the, you know, those are exciting times. So my grandmother moved from Blanderhazard Island into Athens County, Ohio with my grandfather who had wandered from some other part of Ohio. And he built this homestead, as it were, on the first level of a two-level hill the level he was on was about maybe 40 or 50 feet above the above this uh, road level and the floodplain level and then there was another 60 or 80 feet of the hill above him and that became the home yet later on in life of one of my uncles uncle rex well this home which was built by hand has an interesting background in its own right when my father who was an attorney, went to search the deed of the house. He found that there was none. This was, uh, you know, 50 years after it was built. And it turned out that, the, that it never had been a deed. And in fact, my grandmother and grandfather did not actually own the house or the property, that it was true homesteading, that they'd simply... Now, I think as long as they paid the taxes on the property, nobody cared because it was out in the middle of nowhere in the sticks in a place called Hartleyville, which was this tiny, diffuse little town uh, that was largely uh, occupied by impoverished hillbillies, as we used to call them, you know, uh, who had settled there sometime during or after the, the Great Depression and who constituted an incredibly impoverished population. My grandfather and grandmother themselves struggled enormously. I think they'd had a little money in hand. They'd owned their own car and stuff in the 20s, but by the time the Depression came, they'd lost it like everybody else. Um, I guess they couldn't have their house. I guess they couldn't lose their house because the bank had no record of its being owned. So I guess that was an insulation against foreclosure. But my f grandfather heroically survived by working in the mines and in the and by later becoming an amateur, well, professional photographer and doing school pictures. And it's a very complicated story. And it was a story of an enormously difficult survival in a time of a tremendous poverty and want. And my, sis my, my mother and her 10 siblings 
on an amazing survival story of the Depression. Now, that, that is pure background. What I want to tell you today is two fantastic stories of the Hartleyville neighborhood. Now, the road in front of my grandmother's house, which was a dirt road with a little gravelly stone on top of it, and never very worked on by the state government, so it was just a kind of rough road that, that connected a very small neighborhood with, in, in Hartleyville, this town called Hartleyville, onto the main line of the, another small town, which was a little larger, called Gloucester, which was kind of the central place of this small province of inside Athens County, Ohio. So she lived on the hill, and at the foot of the hill was the road. And the road, if you, if you went to the left, when you walked down the hill, down the, down the stone staircase to the, to the road, and you walked to the left, you would get to a, a crossroads of a second road, and you'd turn radically right, even more than 90 degrees. And in that little nook of, the, of these two roads, there was a shack. There was a shack. That, and that, that, that shack when I was a child, was lived in by a single person whose name was Lucy Kaufman. Lucy Kaufman, I think at some time in her life, had been a normal, everyday person. Now she was incredibly poor, and her husband had died 30 years earlier, as I remember, and she'd lived alone in this shack that was so beleaguered that it was beginning to sink into the ground so that the back end of the, of the shack was sort of sinking into the earth and was tilted toward the floodplain field below the house and beside the road. And so the house had this semi-crooked look when you'd look at it. And she was always there, Lucy. And Lucy was a legendary figure. Lucy must have been 80 or more when I was a child in the, in the early 1960s. And the legends of Lucy grew and grew over the years. First of all, she was mad. And secondly, she was dangerous and aggressive. And she owned, people would say, and I, I quote this, a Confederate pistol. Now, why she had a Confederate pistol rather than a Union pistol, even though she lived in Ohio, and all of our known relatives had fought on the side of the North during the war, why she had a Confederate pistol, I don't know, but it was a wonderful symbolic word because it meant the kind of dangerous, you know, radical pistol that somebody would use on you. Some kind of nut would use a Confederate pistol to, to shoot you. And then the idea was that she had this pistol and maybe other firearms, and that at any given moment, because of her madness, she could shoot out through the, the window slots or the, or the door and kill some... Now, there was no evidence for this theory that, that she was on the brink of this act, but all the kids... In the, in the neighborhood, all of my cousins and myself and neighbors all believed that, that she was the most dangerous. And, and, and of course, we only half believed it. And so we would torture the poor woman by saying things into the window to her and mocking her. And even though we almost never saw her, once in a while we'd see her face out the window or walk on the porch briefly. But basically she hid inside this house every season of the year. Now the way she, the fact that she could survive in this house in the dreadful heat of summer without, as far as I could see any, certainly no air conditioning and probably no fan. And then in winter, down in this low hollow, in the cold, in the snow, I don't know, these are mysteries to me. Now she did have a, there was a small uh, butane or, or uh, some kind of heating fuel thing in her yard. It always seemed broken and empty, but maybe she had some kind of heating device in her house. Uh, probably when the house was built, it had a small coal furnace under it, under the ground in, the, in, the, in the, what would have been a small cellar. That was the normal way the houses were built in that world, but I don't know if that was working or if she could manipulate it, but it was amazing to me at least, and maybe to many other people, that she could even live in, in this shack. Well, if you went down the road farther, and we did it almost every day because there was a stream that, that, that bisected this road, and in that stream there were salamanders and tadpoles and, and uh, uh, 
minnows and dace and bluegills, and, and that was our interest. We'd go there every day with dip nets and maybe fishing rods if we were ambitious, and we would, you know, hang out at that stream. And that stream, although it was corrupted because it had a great deal of sulfur from the mine that was north of it, and there was a runoff from the mine, so there was a, a, an acidic, sulfuric smell in the stream, and one felt that at one earlier time it had probably been a very lively place with a, with a, with a lot of uh, fauna, animal life, but this had, was not true now. Now there was one or two salamander kinds and a, occasional fish, and so it was a depleted place, and we had to walk miles from there to find a place, usually in a high elevation, that hadn't been corrupted either by mining or uh, oil, searching for oil in the, in the 50 years earlier. Because oil, the oil industry of the United States began in western Pennsylvania and eastern Ohio. And in those days, you could still see the exhausted arm of a, of a, of a single uh, oil pump across the road from my grandmother's house going up and down, screeching all day long, even though it seemed to produce no oil, as far as anybody could see, except some kind of gritty tar-like stuff that would bubble up around the ground a little. But it, there was no sense in which anybody came to collect the material, so it had apparently been exhausted since World War I or some period, you know, much earlier. And the whole neighborhood, now looking back on it, had been exhausted in part by ecological disasters that had to do with oil and mining. But, that's a, but nonetheless, it was so primitive and it was such semi-wilderness by that time because I think the tr railroad had left the neighborhood, which it had been there in the 20s, and, and all kind of other interests and structures had disappeared. So there was a kind of regrowth of nature in, in Hartleyville because Hartleyville was almost like a wilderness. So if you walk through the fields of Hartleyville, they were, they were chest high in, in, in sumac and, uh, and uh, milkweed and uh, uh, honeysuckle, sassafras. And all of these things were enormously important food for butterflies. Now those plants are largely ex, uh, extinct. Milkweed is almost, un, you know, almost extinct in the United States. Sassafras, highly reduced. Honeysuckle, still beloved because of its odor and sweetness, but, but much rare. But in those days, at least, because those plants had taken over the whole countryside and even covered old houses that were no longer inhabited, there were thousands and thousands of butterflies. And that was one of the main interests of my brother in going to Ohio every summer to in increase his butterfly collection and finding the regal fritillary and the and the, and the red admiral and, and rare, the spice bush swallowtail and all these amazing butterflies that, that still existed because of this enormous flowering plant growth that was still there in those days. But anyway, we went to the stream even if it was a little burnt out and we'd have fun there. Now beside that stream was another house and in that house lived a, a woman in her middle 50s uh, named May, and she was my mother's first cousin. I don't remember, we called her aunt or something, but I don't remember what exactly your mother's first cousin is to you, but in any event, May was a, was a constant known commodity in the family because she lived right around the corner from, you know, the two intersecting roads and past the little stream, and it was the next house after Lucy, so she was like an important person. I remember she had a very aged boyfriend named Ken who was supposed to be a realtor, although I'm, I found it hard to believe given his appearance and his. But May was a kind of aging hillbilly lady herself, but there was a terrible story attached to her which I, in my eavesdropping campaign as a child, I overheard in a discussion between my Aunt Eleanor and my mother. And that story was, and apparently this was true, and, and it was unfortunately the signature story of May, was, was that she, when she had her first child, I don't know if it was her only child, I think she had a child later on in life too, <coughs> but when she had her first child, <coughs> she was 19 or 20 years old, and her husband, who, had, who was, had been a rather wild figure of the area, had left her, and she was alone, 
and she was living in a house either where she was then or near there, and she was accused of having let her child die. This is one of the most famous and mysterious stories that the child had starved. Now, whether the child had starved because she didn't know how to take care of it or, or it was some other health issue, I don't know, but the story given it for the eavesdropper was that she was negligent and she hadn't paid attention to the baby and it died. And this is an amazing, this was so horrible from the point of view of my, my mother and, my, and her sisters and the neighbors that May, it seemed to me, always had her whole life for 50 years after that, uh, this, this scimitar hanging over her head of her early crime and her, her negligence and, her, and this unforgivable error, okay. Now we, the kids, had heard about this story as part of a, of a kind of mythology. And, and we didn't think of it in the same strict moral terms. We had heard, and my uncle, and my, excuse me, my cousin Kurt, I think, had told me this story very explicitly, that the baby had been buried in the field between Lucy's house and May's house, which probably was not true because I don't think May actually lived in that house in those days. But the story was that the baby had been buried in a shallow grave in that field, which, which was on this side of the stream and between Lucy's house and May's house. And I don't remember whether Lucy Kaufman was related to May, but that's possible too, because everybody was somehow related to everybody else, it seemed, in the territory. So, so the, the story was that the, that the baby had become very close to the pet uh, German Shepherd, the family dog, during its brief life, and that the dog loved the baby, so I'm, I'm laughing because this is a miserable and grisly story, but it has a sort of odd edge to it, that the dog loved the baby so much that it would sometimes go out at night, okay, and dig up the grave to sit, lie by the side of the, I guess, remains of the, of the tiny infant or whatever. And th th this fantastic story we filled us with horror. And, and when, on those occasions when King who we actually saw was an aging German shepherd who couldn't possibly have lived 30 years, but let's just pretend that, that King, when he dug up this shallow grave, then the ghost of the baby would rise up out of the grave and walk in the neighborhood. And it's one of the reasons Lucy had her Confederate pistol and hid in her house, because she had seen many times the ghost in this field beside her house and she was terrified. And it was how, some people say it was how she, some of the children said it, how she lost her mind because of the fear of the baby's ever-present ghost. Okay, now I want you to imagine this. If we went at dark, in the dark, on a late summer night, eight or ten of my cousins, down the road in front of the house, around the steep angle, past Lucy's, in this open field with the imaginary shallow grave, the, the dog and the spirits and the, and the, and the, and the, and what, it would, it was a, and we did this. It was a terrible, terrifying experience beyond almost anything I can remember in my life. And whenever we would, we would sleep in the woods, my cousin would tell the story and he would bet us a quarter, my, my older cousin, my brother's age, would bet us a quarter that we didn't have the nerve to walk down into that field in the dark and, and, and see if we could find or, or notice the presence of the ghost. Okay. Well, I'll end the story by saying, telling you an episode in Lucy's life. I now, looking back, feel sorry for Lucy, who's a kind of really... Um, terrible example of um, somebody cut off and mistreated by mankind because of her eccentricities and age and in a way that I would hate to happen to myself or anybody I knew or cared about. But I remember one occasion, Lucy was low, the house was low and below the road, so whenever the floodplain was full, which was a, several times in the summer, the flood would come up, fill the, fill the fields around her house, and soon go into the first floor of her house and fill, you know, run through her house like a river. And this must have happened to her 50 times since the house was built. I don't know, it was like a 
commonplace, and she somehow dealt with this. I don't, not quite sure how. It's probably one of the reasons the house was leaning, as it as it was. And so, on one occasion, there was tremendous rainfall. It lasted like two and days, almost constant. And the floodplain was full, and it was up above the road level. And I remember we went in our in our waders, our wading boots, because we were looking for frogs and snakes and stuff. The, to survive from being drowned would come up to a higher level. And we, so we were collecting them by picking them out of the flood, okay? When we got to Lucy's house, she was on the back porch, which was, a, which was a, about an eight or 10 foot wooden slanted back porch that went down. Into, and, this, and this back porch now was covered with water, maybe, maybe eight or 10 inches of water over the porch. And on the porch, because it was the highest zone in the field, were snakes and toads and frogs. It was just the most amazing scene. There must have been 15 snakes up on the porch in order to, to keep preserve themselves from drowning. Black snakes, hognose snakes, copperheads, uh, you know, on her porch. And she was on her knees in, in, with the water going around her, 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 her Muslim ancient dress that she wore every day. And she was on her knees and the water was rushing around her. And she was praying, and she was saying, God, help and save these poor creatures. They don't understand. They don't understand this flood and this danger. And I pray that you save them all of this suffering because they are innocent. And she was crying and saying this prayer and literally had frogs and <laughs> snakes around her body. It was like something you could not even imagine or, or recreate if you, in your most amazing fantasy. This is my most lasting memory of Lucy Kaufman, one of my heroes.